In total, about 1.3 million Austrians served in the Wehrmacht. Since the Wehrmacht recruited 17.3 million men, this means about 7.5% of the Wehrmacht soldiers were Austrians. Of course, technically during the Second World War there was no Austria, and Austrians were technically German citizens. This is where the Anschluss comes in. On March 12, 1938, German Wehrmacht police and SS units marched into sovereign Austria. The German invaders received a jubilant welcome from large sections of the population and quickly reached Linz, the provincial capital of Upper Austria, and Vienna, the capital. I already made a video on the Anschluss, in which I explained why the Austrians were so welcoming. But here's the short version. Back in 1918, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire dissolved, all major parties were for an Anschluss to Germany. This is also reflected by the fact that the new republic was called Deutsch-Österreich, German-Austria, or other suggested names included either Deutsch or Deutschland in the name. Fast forward to 1938. Germany at this point was doing very well, at least on the outside. This was not the case in Austria. A few years prior, in 1934, the Austrians witnessed at least two civil wars. One where the socialists fought the conservatives, and the other one where the national socialists fought against the conservatives. The latter had also led to the death of the chancellor. Similar to Germany, there was a dictatorship in Austria, yet likely with worse approval ratings. After the occupation of Austria in March 1938, a referendum about the integration of Austria into the German Reich was held in April 1938. The result was a landslide victory. Yet there are also some important points to consider. On April 10, 1938, 99.73% of Austrians voted in favor of Austria's Anschluss to the German Reich in a referendum. The elections cannot be described as secret, universal and free. In the run-up, social pressure was exerted on the undecided and Jews and Mischlinge, mongrels, were excluded from voting. Nevertheless, one must assume that even with less coercion, more than 90% of the Austrian population would have voted for the Anschluss. On the voting ballot, it was asked if the voter approved of the Anschluss, which was called reunification. The interesting part about this is the design or better layout. The circle for a yes was substantially larger than that for a no. Now it is important to add here that after the Second World War, the Austrian shifted quite extensively to an anti-German stance in many regards. As such, depending to whom you talk to, they might have a bit of a different version of these events. Yet let us look at the integration of the Austrian military next. Originally it was planned to slowly integrate the Austrian soldiers into the Wehrmacht, but due to the very positive welcoming of the German troops in Austria, it was decided to speed up the process. As such, already two days after the German troops had crossed the border, Austrian troops gave the oath to Adolf Hitler. In addition to this increase in experience, the incorporation of the Austrian armed forces brought not an inconsiderable strengthening of the army. Thus, in the course of 1938, a total of two infantry divisions, two mountain divisions, one armored division and one light armored division were newly formed. About 60,000 Austrian soldiers were transferred to the Wehrmacht. Of approximately 3,100 Austrian officers, about 1,600 were still accepted into the German officer corps. Note, I used this quote before, but unless I'm mistaken, this is actually slightly incorrect or at least up to debate. There was no panzer division that could be newly formed. The second panzer division was assigned to Vienna and would be in the future receive its reinforcements from this area. As such, at the original home of the second panzer division, the 4th Panzer Division was formed. Yet the 4th Panzer Division received only a few Austrian units, namely two motorized infantry battalions and an artillery battalion were transferred into this division. As such, I am not sure if the one armored division is appropriate here. Note that the also mentioned Light Division later became the 9th Panzer Division. Unsurprisingly, the Wehrmacht removed various people from the old Austrian Guard. The Wehrmacht leadership suspended substantial parts of the old Austrian military elite during the Anschluss period. Two-thirds of Austrian division commanders and a good half of the Austrian regiment commanders left military service. The state secretary and the Ministry of Defense, General Wilhelm Zehner, died under mysterious circumstances. Inspector General Sigismund Schilhaski was compulsorily retired after several arrests, as was the commandant of the Theresian Military Academy Major General Rudolf Tovarek. 
who had refused to take the oath to Hitler. About 50 former Austrian officers that had been suspended previously by the Austrian armed forces due to national socialist activities were reactivated. Generally, the Austrian NCOs and officers at least in monetary and social rank aspects received a considerable upgrade and better career opportunities. Since the Wehrmacht was extremely short on officers, NCOs and specialists, as outlined in my video on the Versailles Treaty's long-term influence on the Wehrmacht, already in the end of 1935 the head of the Heerespersonalamt, the army personal office, was against the further expansion of the army due to a lack of officers, and shortly after the war started the requirements for NCOs were reduced substantially. The shortage of suitable subordinate leaders forced the Wehrmacht leadership to considerably limit its qualitative demands on junior personnel already in the first months of the war. Thus, serving NCOs and enlisted men who had been summarily discharged for lack of ability, unsuitability or even disciplinary offenses could be reinstated at their old rank. This reenlistment even included those that had been dishonorably discharged if the military district command approved of the reenlistment. Apparently, during the short-lived peacetime there were some quarrels, yet those ebbed off rather fast after the war had started. In the war against the Soviet Union, the question of the origin of the formations no longer played a role. The Austrians accepted the Wehrmacht as an institution, so it as the army and for most part re received themselves as equal soldiers and were also seen that way by their Reich German comrades. Yet back to Austria better its part in the German Reich. On the 1st of April 1938, the former Austrian command structure was transferred into the German one. Additionally, two military districts or Wehrkreise, namely the 17th and the 18th, were defined on Austrian territory. These districts were used for regional recruiting and reinforcements. As you can see on the map, the Wehrkreis 17 consists of Upper Austria, Lower Austria and Vienna, whereas the Wehrkreis 18 consists of Carinthia, Styria, Salzburg, Tyrol and Vorarlberg. Note that Burgenland was dissolved after the Anschluss and distributed among Lower Austria and Styria, thanks to Andrew for addressing this. Since we are already on the map, we can also place some of the important divisions. In the west there was the 2. Gebirgsdivision, the 2nd Mountain Division, next is the 45th Infantry Division in Linz, then the 3rd Mountain Division in Graz, in Vienna there was the 2nd Panzer Division, which as previously mentioned was an old German division, then the 4th Life Division, which was basically a weaker Panzer Division. This division would later be upgraded to the 9th Panzer Division. And finally, the 44th Infantry Division. Of course, during the war, more divisions were raised, like the 5th and 6th Gebirgsdivision, additionally, the 297th Infantry Division and the 100th Jäger Division, literally Hunter Division. This was a light infantry division. These two divisions, together with the 44th Infantry Divisions, were encircled at Stalingrad. Probably unsurprising, when it came to the different branches of the Wehrmacht, the Army, das Heer, the Air Force, the Luftwaffe and the Navy, the Kriegsmarine, the latter had rather few Austrians serving in it. Austrians on the other part had represented the Navy at about 4%, only half their average proportion in the Wehrmacht. Generally there is a stereotype that Austrians are a bit more easygoing than the Germans and it seems at least for the Wehrmacht there are some indicators that this might be correct, at least for World War II. Although one of the first two Knights Crosses was awarded to an Austrian, for his achievement in the attack on Warsaw, Josef Stolz, a lieutenant of Austrian origin, was one of the first two soldiers to receive the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. In the course of the following years, 325 more of his compatriots were to receive this award. The question is of course how representative this is. Since 326 Knight's Crosses were awarded to Austrians, we can do a bit of math here. According to Obermanns, the Austrian male population made up 8.71% of Nazi Germany in 1938. Yet in terms of total male losses, the Austrians were 5.51. A total of 7,200 Knight's Crosses were awarded during the war, although some sources note more. Of those, a bit less than 50 were to non-Germans. So let us assume 7,150. This means the Austrians gathered about 4.6% of the Knight's Crosses, since the Austrians made up about 7.5% of the Wehrmacht soldiers and 5.5% of the losses, which means in any way that the Austrians were underrepresented when it came to the Knight's Crosses. But these numbers indicate that the Austrians generally were less eager to fight and die for the Reich, 
According to the prisoners of war questioning done by the Allies in 1943-44, Austrians were more likely to consider desertion. Surprising then was not so much the high results of 190 actual or potential deserters, but rather the distinctiveness of the distribution according to national criteria. While among the 180 Reich Germans questions, 28% showed a possible disposition to desertion among the 200 Austrians interrogated, the figure was 55%. Of course, this is only a minor sample and might not be representative. The historian Richard Geermann notes that the protocols of wiretap prisoners of war show a different picture. Namely, that there were no regional differences in that case. He concludes that, in this respect, the Moscow Declaration of Fall 1943, in which the Allied foreign ministers had decided on the restoration of a sovereign Austria after World War II, and which is seen today as the founding document of the Second Austrian Republic, had little effect on the Austrian prisoners of war. Yet there's other data that points in the direction that Austrians behave differently, namely Obermann's data on German military losses. According to him, about 8% of the Austrian male population died, whereas for all of Germany, including Austria, the number was 13.2%. Of course, there could be several reasons for this. For instance, there were generally a bit less Austrians drafted into the Wehrmacht than Germans, with constituting 8.7% of the male population of Nazi Germany, but only 7.5% of the Wehrmacht soldiers. So it seems that the Austrians had generally a higher survival rate. The question is why was this the case? If the number of knights crosses are an indication likely to the case that the Austrians were less ambitious. Of course, this should not be confused with one of the post-war Austria was a victim of Germany myths. According to this, the Austrians and the German armed forces had been treated particularly harshly and humiliatingly by the Germans, and they had been forced to fight the hated Hitler war. This has been ensured, so the argumentation continued by the strong saturation of military formations in the Ostmark, which was the official name of Austrian territory in Nazi Germany, with Reich Germans. The Austrians had thus become a minority in these formations. As so often, such myths don't hold up to proper research and data. The author points out that companies in Austrian formations in 1939 had more than 80% of Austrians in it. Also, the NCOs were mostly from Austria as well. If not, it would have been also an exception to the regional recruitment practice of the Wehrmacht. To summarize, following the Anschluss, the Austrian armed forces were successfully integrated in the Wehrmacht. Additionally, Austria was fully integrated in the German recruitment and reinforcement systems. Generally, Austrians did their part in the fighting, although numbers like losses and awards of night crosses indicate that the Austrians were a bit less eager to fight for the Reich. Also, please forgive me, that I didn't include a disparaging comment about Vienna this time, I will try to do better next time. Well, I hope you liked this episode. Thank you for Andrew for reviewing the script. As always, source are listed in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.